<laughs> Hi, friends. I'm your old pal, Papa Dale. I'm a retired pastor, teacher, theologian, and professor with over 50 years of service to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, my name is Dale Warren. Professionally, I'm known in my lectures, teaching, and writings as D.A. Warren. Uh, but my friends just call me Papa Dale, and so you can call me Papa Dale, too. Now, you can see the details of my personal testimony, my family life, education, and ministry experience on other videos on this playlist. So, for now, let's just jump right into today's teaching. And the topic for today is the Titus Lecture. And so, this is one of the last books in the New Testament. And it is the Epistle to Titus. Now, this is the JHI, Bachelor of Arts degree in Biblical Literature. And this is the Titus Lecture. So, let's get right into it. Pardon me. The Epistle to Titus is a letter found in the New Testament. And it was written by the Apostle Paul to Titus, a young pastor and missionary, serving on the island of Crete. In this letter, Paul offers counsel on church leadership, ethical living, and crucial roles of sound doctrine. Paul had left Titus and Crete to continue the work of establishing and organizing churches. His letter aims to provide practical instructions for the growing Christian community, particularly in addressing the unique challenges posed by the local context. Crete was known for its moral laxity and for the prevalence of false teachings, both of which threatened the spiritual health of the churches there. See Titus 1.5 and 12-13. Now there's a central theme in uh, the epistle, and it is the qualification of church leaders. Paul details the traits required of elders and bishops, stressing their moral integrity, teaching ability, and leadership skills. Elders, he writes, must be blameless, faithful to their spouse, and good stewards of their household. See Titus 1.6. Paul also emphasizes their duty to safeguard the church by refuting false teachings and protecting believers from misleading influences. They are to hold firmly to the trustworthy message so that they can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose sound doctrine. See Titus chapter 1 verse 9. Paul, st Paul stresses the vital importance of adhering to sound doctrine. False teachings had infiltrated the church as they did all over the period of the New Testament times, and they always have. From that time until this, false teachings had infiltrated the church. We have to be constantly on guard. And Paul warns against such distortions of the gospel. He encourages Titus to teach what is appropriate and what is appropriate to sound doctrine. See Titus 2 verse 1. Underscoring the connection between sound teaching and moral living. The gospel's power to transform lives is evident through good works, which, serves, which serve as a witness to the truth of the message preached. See Titus 3.8. This adherence to sound doctrine forms the foundation for the church's mission and for individual believers' daily conduct. Now, there is also the theme of ethical living. Paul offers specific guidelines for various groups within the church, calling for each to live in a way that reflects the gospel. Older men are to be temperate, dignified, sound in faith. See Titus 2.2. Older women are to be reverent in their behavior, teaching younger women to love their families and to be self-controlled. Titus 2.3-5. Young men are similarly urged to exercise self-control, modeling good deeds and integrity. Titus 2, 6 or 7. And Paul emphasizes that all Christians should live in a manner that reflects their faith, 
demonstrating the transforming grace of God in every area of life. Now, another theme is the relationship of the church to society. In addition to church life, Paul offers guidance on how Christians should interact with the broader society as a whole. Believers are called to be subject to the rulers and authorities, to be ready for every good work, and to speak evil of no one. See Titus 3, 1 through 2. This advice aims to ensure that Christians maintain a positive witness in their community, reflecting the grace of God through their conduct. Paul encourages Titus to remind believers that their behavior towards others should be marked by humility and gentleness, reflecting the mercy and kindness that they have received through Christ, Titus 3, 3 through 5. And there's the theme of the grace of God. At the heart of Paul's message is the theme of God's grace. He reminds Titus that the church, that salvation is not earned by human effort, but it's a gift, a gift of God's grace. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people, he tells Titus in chapter 2, verse 11. This grace is not only the foundation of salvation, but also the power that transforms believers, enabling them to live lives marked by good works and moral integrity. Titus 2, 12-14 Paul makes it clear that God's grace is the source of ethical teachings that he provides, and it is this grace that equips believers to live in a way that honors God. In summary, the epistle to Titus provides practical instructions for church leadership and personal conduct, with strong emphasis on sound doctrine and the transforming power of God's grace. It addresses the need for qualified leaders, outlines the moral expectations for various groups within the church, and encourages believers to maintain a positive witness in the broader, in the broader society. By following Paul's guidance, the church in Crete would remain faithful to the gospel and fulfill its mission effectively. Well, now let's look at some literary analytical points. It is a bachelor's degree in biblical literature, of all things. So, uh, we need to understand Greek idioms and Hebrew idioms and literature types and literary devices. These concepts are crucial when analyzing any of the Bible books and also the book of Titus, as well as all the other biblical texts. Greek idioms can reveal deeper meanings that may not be apparent in translation, helping readers grasp the text's intended message. Recognizing literature types, such as epistles, allows for an appreciation of the stylistic and rhetorical approaches employed by the author. And in addition, literary devices like metaphors and parallelism and allusions enhance the richness of the text, adding layers of significance. In the context of Titus, these elements provide insights into the church leadership and sound teaching, reinforcing the epistle's enduring relevance. And so here are some examples of Greek idioms. Greek idioms, by the way, often convey deeper meanings and cultural nuances that enrich the text. And so we see the first one, good deeds. And we find this in Titus chapter 2, verse 7. In the Greek, this phrase reflects the importance of ethical living as a testimony to faith. And then the second one that we look at is called, or is, sound doctrine. And this we see in Titus 1, verse 9. This idiom implies teaching that is healthy, robust, and aligned with true Christian belief. Then we also find the Greek idiom, foolish controversies, Titus 3, 9. This phrase indicates trivial disputes that distract from the centrality of the gospel. 
And then there is the idiom, the grace of God. This is an idiom, well, we see this in Titus 2.11, by the way, but this is an idiom symbolizing God's unmerited favor and emphasizing salvation and life transformation. Number five is self-control. See Titus 1.8. This represents a deeper moral responsibility, urging believers to exercise restraint and wisdom. And lastly, we see the Greek idiom, speak evil of no one. This we see in Titus 3.2. This is a call to gentleness, urging followers to avoid slander and strife. Now, there are also Hebrew idioms involved in the book of Titus. And these reflect Hebrew wisdom and teachings. We uh, will illustrate this by uh, looking at six of them. The first one is the phrase sound doctrine. We see this in Titus 1.9. This phrase e echoes the Hebrew emphasis on wisdom and truth seen in Proverbs 4.2. And by the way, you're going to see some overlap. Greek idioms and Hebrew idioms are uh, the same or very similar. Uh, in a lot of cases. So Hebrew idiom number two is devote themselves to good works, Titus 3.8. This reflects the Hebrew principle of actions reflecting faith, as seen, as, as seen in Micah 6.8. And then number three is rebellious people. We see this in Titus 1.10, and it corresponds to the Hebrew tradition of disobedience found in Proverbs. 1711. Hebrew tradition of disobedience. It's, it's like it's written right into their traditions. <laughs> but, um, excuse my itchy nose, um, <laughs> but they are a rebellious people, and we all are. We're all rebellious. It's just our sin nature. So then another Hebrew phrase is pure to those who are pure. See Titus 1.15. This mirrors the Hebrew notion of moral purity highlighted in Psalm 24.4. Then there is the phrase or the idiom, admonish and encourage. We see this in Titus 1.9. And this resonates with the Hebrew practice of teaching and correction as seen in Proverbs 27.17. There also is the sixth one, uh, that of a faithful steward. Titus 1.7. This reflects the Hebrew concept of stewardship, akin to Genesis 2.15. Now, these idioms illustrate the continuity of Hebrew values in Paul's guidance to Titus. There are also literature types. The book of Titus showcases a variety of literature types that contribute to its teaching and exhortation. Once again, we see six of them. The first one is epistle literature, and of course, the book is structured as a letter, so the whole thing is an epistle. But uh, this form of writing provides guidance to Titus about church leadership and practical Christian conduct. conduct see Titus 1.1. 1, 1. Then we have didactic, didactic literature, and these are instructional teachings, and they are prominent with a focus on sound faith and morality. Titus 2, 1 through 10. We also see some uh, wisdom literature in the letter. This offers practical advice and insights for living a righteous life. Titus 2, 12 is a, an example for us. Another literature type is proverb literature. It contains wise sayings that reflect Christian values and ethics. Titus 2, 3. And then there is also narrative literature. While not predominantly narrative, the context of Titus's mission prompts storytelling elements about the early church. And lastly, we see number six, law literature. This encourages it to adherence to moral and ethical standards as part of church conduct. See Titus 3.1. There are also literary devices, as there are in every Bible book. There are a lot of them in this book. We only have time to look at six. And uh, what these do is they enhance the message that the writer is trying to convey. So we see prose as a literary device, and 
The text is primarily presented in prose, providing straightforward instruction. Titus 1 4 is the example, and uh, no big mystery there. Then we see metaphors. The idea of sound doctrine serves as a metaphor for healthy teaching that nurtures faith. See Titus 1 9. There are, all, are also examples of synonymous parallelism. See Titus 2 7. These are phrases in Titus that often reflect similar ideas, such as the call for good works and righteous living. And then there is contrast. The distinctions between believers and false teachers highlight the importance of sound faith. See Titus 1 10 through 11. There's also imagery. This is descriptive language, which is used to visualize attributes of teachers and leaders, such as being above reproach. See Titus 1 6. And then the last uh, literary device is allusion. Allusion. This is references to Old Testament ideals that can be seen in guidance for moral behavior. Titus 2, uh, 1 through 10. Recognizing and understanding Greek idioms, Hebrew idioms, literature types, literary devices, enriches the process of biblical interpretation. These elements impact the text's meaning and significance, offering clarity that is often lost in translations. By identifying idiomatic expressions, readers can unco uncover cultural nuances that inform the text's context. Understanding the various genres at play, such as epistles versus narratives, helps readers engage appropriately with the content. Additionally, literary devices invite deeper reflection and appreciation of the scripture's artistry. Overall, this analytical approach leads to a more informed and transformative experience when engaging with biblical literature, including the book of Titus. Now, the epistle to Titus is one of three pastoral epistles, along with 1 and 2 Timothy. Traditionally, it's attributed to the Apostle Paul, and Titus is a close companion of Paul, so that makes sense. And he is mentioned in other New Testament writings, notably in Galatians, where he accompanied Paul on a journey to Jerusalem. See Galatians 2, verses 1 and 3. Titus was also sent to Corinth to help resolve conflicts within the church there. See 2 Corinthians 7, 6 through 7, and chapters 13 and 14. Now, in this letter, in the letter to Titus, pardon me, in this letter, Paul instructs Titus to continue organizing the church in Crete, an island known for its difficult moral climate, and later encourages Titus to meet him in Nicopolis. See Titus 3, verse 12. Titus is not mentioned in the Acts of the Apostles, but early Christian writings such as Eusebius' Ecclesiastical History suggest that Titus became the first bishop of Crete. His work in organizing the church and, prom and promoting sound doctrine laid the foundation for future generations of believers in the region. The most frequently memorized verse from the book of Titus is often Titus 2.11, which says, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. And of course, he's speaking of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. This verse highlights the central theme of God's grace and salvation, which is a key message in Paul's letter to Titus. It is a reminder of the universal offer of salvation and the transforming power of grace. Now, this has been your old pal, Papa Dale. The year is 2024. I apologize to the vagaries of the lighting. I use a lot of natural lighting for these lectures. And uh, sometimes if there are clouds moving through the area, it can be uh, a little um, unpredictable. So, anyway, to finish up here, uh, you, uh, you probably remember in every lecture I remind you that if you are studying to earn the Bachelor of Arts in Biblical Literature degree, 
It is required that you not only watch the lectures twice, but that you read through these lecture notes. And as you read through the lecture notes, you are also required to look up every Bible citation and read that. Now, the lecture notes can be found in the video transcript, and uh, they can also be found at a link that is at the bottom of the video right here itself that you just watched. So, uh, Lord willing, I shall return with other videos. And until then, this is your old pal, Papa Dale, saying, I'm signing off for now, but I will be praying for you that you will be well and that you will be blessed. Ha, ha, ha.